Terrorists, assassins, mafia bosses, serial killers. The Russian courts have given them the maximum penalty, life imprisonment. The biggest prisoner swap since the end of the Cold War has taken place between Russia and the West. Russia's Owl Prison is unlike any place you've ever heard of. Located in one of the most extreme regions of Russia, it's known for its unforgiving, icy temperatures that plunge to an unimaginable minus 50 degrees Celsius. Imagine trying to survive in such freezing cold, where each breath feels like knives cutting through you and hope is a luxury no one dares to cling to. This isn't just a prison. It's a place where survival is almost impossible, and many prisoners believe they'll never make it out alive. Five years, seven months, five days as a hostage uh, in Russia, in extremely poor conditions, um, it takes a toll. Unlike other infamous Russian prisons, such as the Black Dolphin or the overcrowded and food-deprived Buka prison, Owl Prison takes brutality to an entirely different level. Here, every aspect of life seems carefully crafted to break inmates down, both physically and mentally, leaving them fighting against not only the guards, but also the relentless forces of nature. Life in Owl Prison is beyond harsh. There's no warmth, no relief, and definitely no comfort. The walls, thick with ice, seem to absorb any glimmer of warmth or hope. For the prisoners, every day is a battle against the cold that seeps into their bones, making it almost impossible to move, let alone survive. Food is scarce, medical help is minimal, and any sign of weakness can mean the difference between life and death. These men, some of Russia's most dangerous criminals, face a punishment that goes far beyond their sentences. It's a punishment that takes away their humanity, bit by bit. As temperatures drop and days turn into endless nights, prisoners know that escape isn't an option, and survival seems like a distant dream. Owl Prison isn't just a place where prisoners serve time. It's where they expect to meet their end, consumed by the brutal cold. It's a haunting reality that most won't make it out alive, as each day chips away at their spirit, pushing them closer to the brink. In a land where mercy doesn't exist and the cold shows no pity, Russia's Owl Prison has earned its terrifying reputation as one of the world's most unforgiving places to be locked away. Russia's Polar Owl and Polar Wolf Prisons, deep in Russia's freezing Ural Mountains, lies a place so cold and bleak that it seems more like a frozen wasteland than a prison. Known as the Polar Owl and Polar Wolf Prisons. In the IK-3 prison camp in Karp on charges of extremism and fraud. Nicknamed as the Polar Wolf, this penal colony is located in yamalo Ninets region, well above the Arctic Circle. These two brutal facilities are among Russia's most notorious, feared even by the toughest criminals. Hidden away in the remote settlement of KP, 1,200 miles northeast of Moscow, these prisons are home to Russia's worst offenders. Murderers, mafia bosses, and political opponents, people deemed too dangerous for ordinary jails. Here, time stands still, and the prisoners are left to battle the icy grip of nature and the cruelty within prison walls. These prisons weren't always meant to hold Russia's most violent criminals. Back in 1961, the area began as a labor camp where prisoners toiled to build a railway. But today, the polar owl and polar wolf have a far grimmer purpose. The polar owl, also known as IK-8, is a supermax prison designed for convicts serving life sentences. It sits near the So River, surrounded by high, rugged mountains, but there's nothing calm about it. The landscape hides a brutal climate where temperatures often plunge to minus 40 degrees Celsius and snow covers the ground most of the year. For the prisoners, there's no escape from the biting cold that seeps into their cells and bones. Inside, life is a nightmare. Inmates are locked in small cells, isolated, with no one to talk to. The silence is haunting, and they're only allowed one short family visit a year, a brief glimpse of the world outside. Every day, they follow strict routines, with no chance to sit or lie on their beds until nightfall. 
the polar owl was created to break even the strongest, stripping away every bit of hope and human connection. One prisoner once said that surviving here felt impossible, as if the prison's only goal was to crush the spirit. The polar wolf, also known as IK-3, is even worse. This prison made international news in 2023 when Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was sent there, only to die two months later. Where the prison service has announced that the jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny has died. In a statement, it said he felt unwell after a walk and almost immediately lost consciousness. The Interfax news agency says medics spent more than half an hour trying to resuscitate him. Conditions are unthinkable. Prisoners have little to no heat, with some cells offering nothing but a fake radiator painted on the wall. In winter, guards force prisoners to stand outside in temperatures as low as minus 45 degrees Celsius. Spring brings more misery as prisoners endure swarms of biting flies and mosquitoes, unable to swat them away without facing punishment. Polar wolf breaks any sense of unity as inmates are forced to spy on each other just to survive. Here, trust is dangerous, and even those who leave carry the trauma long after they're free. P attack prison. Imagine being trapped in a tiny cell for almost 23 hours each day, knowing that you may never see freedom again. This is the harsh reality for prisoners at Pak Prison, located on a remote island in Russia's Volga region, between Moscow and the Arctic Circle. Surrounded by thick forests and the icy waters of White Lake, this prison feels more like a life sentence with no escape than a place of punishment. Often called Russia's version of Alcatraz, Pak Prison holds around 200 of the most dangerous criminals locked away within its thick, white brick walls and barbed wire. Originally, this site was an old Orthodox monastery. Now it's a fortress designed to keep prisoners in and hope out. Trying to dig a tunnel to escape would only lead to water, and anyone attempting to swim would face gunfire from vigilant guards long before reaching the shore. But the guards are just part of the threat here. Life inside Pak is harsh and relentless. Prisoners spend over 22 hours each day locked in cramped twin cells, only allowed outside for 90 minutes to pace back and forth in a tiny outdoor cage. This lack of movement and sunlight takes a heavy toll. Prison psychologists say that after just a few years here, prisoners lose touch with who they once were. Their personalities and spirits fade away. Basic needs are barely met. There is no running water in their cells, no proper bathrooms, and few places to clean up. New video shows a glimpse of what life was like for WNBA star Brittany Griner inside Russian prison. She spent her days carrying fabric because she was too tall to sit at the sewing tables where other prisoners worked. Illnesses are common, with many prisoners suffering from tuberculosis. But more than anything, it's the isolation that breaks them. Prisoners are only allowed two visitors a year. One prisoner even told his wife to leave him and move on with her life, knowing that the prison had taken away more than just his freedom. It had taken his connections, his old life, and his hope. If someone steps out of line, the punishments are severe. Prisoners may be sent to a pitch-black cell with only a metal bucket, a wooden perch, and no light. It's quiet, but far from peaceful. The darkness and isolation only intensify the psychological strain. Some prisoners reach a point where they harm themselves, swallowing things like nails or spoons to get sent to the prison hospital. A place that, compared to their cells, feels like a small escape, even if only temporary. Escaping Pak is impossible. Surrounded by freezing waters and armed guards, even the most determined wouldn't make it far. For most inmates, the end of their story is a simple burial in a nearby village, with a serial number in place of a name. Black Dolphin Prison, Russia's Black Dolphin Prison in the Orenburg region, is known as one of the country's scariest prisons. Criminals across Russia fear it deeply. Human rights barely seem to matter behind its walls. Named after a statue of a black dolphin at the entrance, this prison holds some of the worst criminals. Serial killers, cannibals, terrorists, and others. Interestingly, 
The dolphin statue wasn't made by any famous artist. It was crafted by the prisoners themselves. There is no outdoor yard here, so exercise means pacing back and forth in a tiny indoor cell. While they do this, guards search their cells to make sure they haven't hidden anything they shouldn't have. Meals are another harsh reality. There's no cafeteria. Prisoners eat in their cells, soup and bread, four times a day. For entertainment, they only have access to books, newspapers, and a radio. No TV, no phone calls, no chance to connect with anyone outside. At Black Dolphin, there's one rule everyone understands. You don't leave. The Black Dolphin, Russia's highest security prison. It is here that some of the country's worst maniacs, serial killers, terrorists, and even cannibals. The only way out of Black Dolphin is in a coffin. It's a life sentence in every possible way. This prison is designed not only to lock criminals up, but to break them mentally with isolation and strict control over their daily lives. But if you think Black Dolphin is bad, you haven't heard about Butka Prison. It's a place even more extreme. Subscribers to pick. Today, we're looking at a haunting image of tiger cages in Vietnam, a symbol of cruelty during the Vietnam War. These barbed wire cages confined prisoners in tiny, stifling spaces where they endured intense torture. The cages were so small that prisoners couldn't even sit up straight, forcing them to stay in cramped, painful positions for days or even weeks. The bars on the ceiling allowed guards to strike prisoners with sticks or throw quick lime on them, which burned their skin and sometimes blinded them. The intense sun, along with very little food and water, made survival nearly impossible. While Russian prisons, where inmates expect to die in minus 50 degrees Celsius temperatures, might seem like a completely different nightmare, both systems show the darkest aspects of human cruelty. Whether it's freezing to death in Russia or suffering unbearable heat in Vietnam, these prisons highlight the extreme measures regimes take to break their prisoners. What would you do if you were trapped in a cage like this? Could you survive such cruelty and still hold on to hope? Burka Prison. This next prison has such a dark reputation that it is hard to believe it still exists. Located in Moscow, Butka Prison has been around for over 250 years, becoming a symbol of suffering during that time. Many people have heard about the awful conditions inside, the human rights violations, and the daring escapes but what happens behind those cold, crumbling walls is worse than most can imagine. Today, Butka Prison is overcrowded. Cells meant for 10 people are crammed with over 100 inmates, leaving barely any room to breathe. In some areas, the roof leaks, and the mold covering the walls and ceilings is so thick it's almost suffocating. This situation is especially difficult for prisoners with illnesses. Keep dangerous inmates out of sight, also hiding allegations of abuse, disease outbreaks, severe overcrowding. Many suffer from tuberculosis or AIDS. Sick inmates are often put together with no real effort to stop the spread of these diseases. To make matters worse, drug users share one needle, creating a perfect environment for diseases to spread. Getting from the prison to court is just as bad. The police vans that transport inmates are also overcrowded, placing healthy prisoners next to those with contagious diseases. The conditions inside the prison vans are as terrible as those in the cells. It's a wonder how anyone can survive long enough to make it to trial inside Butka. Basic human needs are hard to find. There is only cold tap water, and showers are a luxury that only happens once a week. Anything beyond that, like food, a television, or even a fridge, must come from the inmates themselves or their families. If they are lucky enough to receive a care package, it might arrive a day late. It is clear that the prison system does not care about the well-being of those locked inside. Instead, inmates are left to fend for themselves with little help from the authorities. Communication with the outside world is nearly impossible for prisoners. For those who can afford mobile phones, they become a lifeline, but they come at a steep cost. Phones inside the prison are so rare and fragile 
that they are called crystalware. Getting one is expensive, and keeping it hidden is even harder. Guards regularly search for phones, and losing one if it's found is common. Some guards do not bother to report finding a phone. They would rather keep it for themselves. Escape attempts used to happen more often, but now they are almost impossible. The last successful escape was in 2010, when a young man named Vitali managed to break free from the prison's mental ward. He overpowered a guard and jumped over the fence and barbed wire, disappearing. The media was fascinated by his story, calling his escape fantastic and supernatural. Prison guards were left scratching their heads, wondering how he scaled a five-meter wall in seconds. However, Vitali's freedom did not last long. He was caught two years later in Finland and brought back to Butka. Since then, security has become even tighter, with over 400 cameras now watching every corner of the prison, making escape attempts a thing of the past. Despite the high-tech surveillance and strict security, life inside remains brutal. The prisoners here are awaiting trial and have not yet been convicted of any crime, but they are treated as if they have already been sentenced to death. The guards show little sympathy. It is not uncommon to hear of inmates taking their own lives or being found dead under suspicious circumstances. There are whispers of torture, and marks of violence are often seen on the bodies of the deceased. Speaking of torture, this next prison was specifically designed to break prisoners down mentally. It's really hard to, even now, hard to describe. And that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to remove our sense of individualism, remove our sense of humanity, and give us each a number. Lafortovo Prison. Lafortovo Prison, located on the outskirts of Moscow, has long been a symbol of fear and control in Russia. Built in the late 1800s, it was originally designed under French rule. Tucked away in an unassuming four-story building, it later became famous for its role during Soviet times. Lefortovo isn't just a prison. It is a place meant to break a person, especially those who dare to challenge the Russian government. The yellow-walled building, shaped like the letter K, feels like a trap from the moment you enter. Every former inmate describes it as a place built to make you feel isolated, the prison's corridors are covered with worn-out carpets that muffle sounds, creating a chilling quietness. It's as if the prison itself is trying to erase any trace of life. Even though Lefortovo is technically a pre-trial detention center, prisoners can spend years locked up there waiting for their cases to move forward, and some never leave. In the early 2000s, Lefortovo was transferred from the Federal Security Service to the Justice Ministry. This change came after a request from the Council of Europe. We heard an alarm go off and a member of staff had been assaulted. But in some rare cases, inmates transferred from other prisons might get the chance to eat in a communal dining area. The prison is packed with security measures. There are motion detectors, cameras, and 1,400 remote-controlled steel doors throughout the facility. Officers in a central control room keep a close eye on inmates 24 sevenths. If there's even a hint of an escape attempt, they can hit a panic button that locks down the entire prison. The perimeter is secured with pressure pads, 12-foot-high razor wire fences, and heavily armed guards who patrol the area. Inside ADX Florence, there are six different levels of security. These include general population units, which are further divided into Delta, Echo, Fox, and Golf units. Then there's the Special Housing Unit, the Special Security Unit, also called H Unit, the Control Unit, and the Intermediate or Transitional Units, known as Kilo and Joker. There's also Range 13, a highly restricted area that only has four cells, meant for prisoners who need the highest level of control. The Control Unit is where they house inmates who have committed violent acts in other prisons or hold high-ranking positions in dangerous prison gangs. The H unit, on the other hand, is reserved for inmates who are involved in terrorist activities or are under special administrative measures. Range 13 is the most secure area in the prison, reserved for those who need extreme levels of supervision. Finally, there are the intermediate units, where step-down inmates are placed. These are prisoners who, if they behave well, might eventually be transferred to another prison with fewer restrictions. 
This is the only part of ADX Florence where inmates can lock themselves in their cells and interact with others, but only if they follow the rules. A rare look inside an Arizona state prison in Kagan was the only Tucson station with access. A new maximum security facility at the Lewis Prison Complex in Buckeye will soon house hundreds of the most violent criminals. In 2007, the media was allowed to tour ADX Florence for the first time. Reporters were taken aback by how eerily quiet the prison felt, with one producer from 60 Minutes, Henry Schuster, noting how quickly the small cells could make a person feel trapped. Unlike other prisons like California's overcrowded Pelican Bay, ADX Florence was praised for its high staff-to-inmate ratio and strong security measures. Following a 1998 tour, Jamie Fellner from Human Rights Watch even acknowledged the prison's strict yet effective approach. But what's it really like to live there? Inmates in ADX Florence endure extremely harsh conditions. In 2012, a group of 11 prisoners filed a class action lawsuit against the Bureau of Prisons, accusing the facility of cruel treatment and neglecting the needs of mentally ill inmates. Known as Cunningham v. Federal Bureau of Prisons, the case highlighted a grim reality. At least six inmates had taken their own lives, and sadly, another did after the lawsuit was filed. Critics argue that the long-term solitary confinement in cells takes a serious toll on mental health, with studies backing this up. By 2015, settlement discussions were underway, and the prison had already begun making adjustments. Some inmates in the prison's notorious H unit face even tighter restrictions under special administrative measures, SAMs, which severely limit their ability to communicate with family, lawyers, or the outside world. In fact, these extreme measures were cited in 2012 when a British magistrate refused to extradite Julian Assange to the US, worried he might end up in ADX Florence. However, by July 2021, the court agreed to revisit the case, with the U.S. promising that Assange wouldn't face Sam's or be sent to ADX Florence if extradited. Despite the prison's reputation for containing the nation's most dangerous criminals, it has also seen tragedy. At least eight inmates have died by suicide or are suspected to have done so. The first was Kevin Lee Wilson, a 37-year-old convicted bank robber who died in 1999. Dangerous inmates coming to an end this morning. This is video of them being taken back to jail. Next was Gregory Britt, 43, who passed away the same year after being convicted of fatally attacking another inmate. Others, like Lawrence Clear, Lance Van Deren, and John Frierson, also met similar fates, each having been sentenced to ADX Florence for violent crimes. One case in particular, Jose Martin Vega, who died in 2010, stands out. A gang member sentenced to four life terms plus 190 years, Vega had been involved in a range of violent activities. Other notable cases include Robert Gerald King, who took his life in 2013, and Jimmy Gerald McMahon, who died in 2017 after serving a life sentence for a violent spree that included murder and bank robbery. Life at ADX Florence isn't just tough. It can be unbearable for some. Those unable to endure the harsh conditions have tragically ended their lives. Others who survived suicide attempts found themselves punished for the effort. Some inmates even resorted to extreme self-harm, cutting off body parts or enduring months of squalor. Over the years, ADX Florence inmates had filed 14 lawsuits before the Cunningham case, but all were dismissed before going to trial. In Texas, a man is now charged with capital murder in connection to the death of an 11-year-old girl. The local sheriff says that he was a family friend. A search team found the body of Audrey Cunningham in a river on Tuesday. This time, however, the legal battle carried on, with productive conversations taking place between prison officials, Department of Justice lawyers, and the inmates' attorneys. Most of the original plaintiffs from the lawsuit were transferred to other facilities where they now receive more appropriate care. One of them was Jonathan Francisco, whose severe mental illness led the Bureau of Prisons to move him to a better suited facility in 2013. Harold Cunningham, a lead plaintiff, is serving a life sentence plus 380 years for multiple crimes, 
including murder. Back in 1996, while representing himself in a trial, Cunningham dramatically stabbed a witness in open court. Diagnosed with severe mental illness, Cunningham arrived at ADX Florence in 2001, where his medication was taken away, and he was placed in the control unit, where inmates weren't allowed medication. Years later, he had a telepsychiatry session while handcuffed and surrounded by guards, hardly an environment for proper mental health treatment. Another original plaintiff, John Jack Powers, entered the prison system with no history of mental illness, but things quickly spiraled after he witnessed a murder behind bars. Diagnosed with PTSD, his mental health deteriorated as he bounced between different facilities, leading him to self-harm. At one point, Powers even bit off his pinky. ADX Florence didn't provide the help he needed, and he only began to recover after being moved to a mental health facility. But the cycle restarted when he was sent back to Colorado. Since the lawsuit, the Bureau of Prisons has made some significant changes. They now have private spaces for confidential mental health consultations and group therapy sessions. The number of mental health staff at ADX has more than doubled, and new policies ensure prisoners are properly screened for mental illness before, during, and after arrival. If a condition is detected, the inmate is either transferred to a suitable facility or treated at ADX depending on their security needs. The control unit's ban on psychotropic medication has also been lifted, ensuring prisoners who need serious treatment get it. This settlement didn't come easily. Mediation overseen by Magistrate Judge Michael Hegarty took hundreds of hours over several years, with tensions running so high that negotiations stalled for a year. However, most plaintiffs are now benefiting from the changes and support the settlement. So who are the inmates currently benefiting from these policies? One of the most infamous is Zacharias Moussaoui, born in France and a member of Al-Qaeda. Zacharias Moussaoui. Acting independently, the men tipped off the FBI about a month before the September 11th attacks. But when it came to handing out $5 million under the State Department's Rewards for Justice program, Moussaoui admitted in court that he conspired to kill U.S. citizens as part of the 9-11's attacks. He is the only person convicted in the U.S. for the September 11th tragedy and is serving life imprisonment without parole at ADX Florence. Arrested in Minnesota for an immigration violation just weeks before the attacks, his suspicious behavior during flight training raised red flags. Though prosecutors struggled to prove he was directly involved with the 19 hijackers, they argued that Musawi was intended to be the 20th hijacker. In 2006, he narrowly avoided the death penalty and was instead sentenced to life in prison. As he left the courtroom, Musawi mocked the U.S., claiming victory in his own twisted way. Another high-profile inmate at ADX Florence is Djokar Sarnaev, Boston Marathon bomber Johar Zarnayev is suing the federal government for $250,000, claiming his treatment at the federal Supermax Correctional Complex Florence has been unlawful, unreasonable, and discriminatory. Responsible for the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013 alongside his older brother, Tamerlan. Their pressure cooker bombs killed three people and injured over 260 others. Just days later, the brothers shot and killed MIT police officer Sean Collier before engaging in a deadly shootout with the police. It's a newspaper ad featuring a tribute to police officer Sean Collier, killed in the line of duty. And this weekend, it's set to run online and in Boston's two major newspapers. Collier, of course, was working for MIT when he was killed by the Boston Marathon bomber. Tamerlan was killed in the confrontation, but Jokar escaped only to be found hiding in a boat. During questioning, he revealed plans to attack Times Square and said he was inspired by extremist ideologies. In 2015, Sarnaev was sentenced to death and is currently on death row at ADX Florence. Zacharias Musawi and Djokar Sarnaev are just two examples of the high-profile inmates housed in the most secure prison in America. Their stories highlight the gravity of the crimes committed by those sent to ADX Florence and the lengths the U.S. justice system goes to contain and manage such dangerous individuals. In October 2005, authorities started questioning Gadia and even searched his luxurious multi-million dollar home in Hawaii. 
It wasn't long before he was arrested for leaking secret defense information to unauthorized individuals. This sensitive info was linked to the B-2 stealth project and was shared with at least eight foreign countries, exposing crucial details about the stealth technology. Gadia admitted he passed along classified information to enhance his reputation with potential clients. After his arrest, he was held without bail. On October 26, 2005, he faced charges in the United States District Court for the District of Hawaii for willfully communicating national defense information to someone not entitled to receive it, information that could potentially harm the U.S. or benefit a foreign nation. Fast forward to November 8, 2006, when a federal grand jury in Honolulu indicted Gadia on 18 counts. The indictment revealed that he had secretly designed a stealth cruise missile nozzle for China, making it harder for the U.S. to detect. It accused him of conspiring to violate the Arms Export Control Act by agreeing to design and test this stealth technology for China without U.S. approval. The indictment also highlighted his six trips to China, his secretive emails with co-conspirators, and his covert travels to help China develop this advanced technology. On top of that, Gadia faced three counts of willfully sharing classified information with Chinese representatives, which benefited China and harmed U.S. interests. He was also charged with two counts of unlawfully passing classified info to individuals in China and helping design stealth technology for Chinese missiles, not to mention money laundering. And speaking of things that are outrageous, let me tell you about China's new technology that promises to make fighter jets invisible, silent, and more deadly. Then there's James J. Marcello. On December 15, 1992, federal authorities charged him and notorious mob boss Sam Wings Carisi with racketeering. Marcello was accused of being Carisi's underboss, overseeing criminal operations in Chicago's western suburbs. The following year, on December 16, 1993, Marcello, Carisi, and five crew members were convicted of racketeering. Marcello was particularly found guilty of running illegal bookmaking and loan sharking schemes in the area. Both Marcello and Carisi were also convicted of plotting to eliminate gangland associate Anthony Dadino, who had become a potential informant. Furthermore, Marcello was convicted of funding mobster Lenny Patrick's loan sharking business and ordering a firebomb attack on the Lake Theater in Oak Park during a labor dispute. On April 5, 1995, Marcello received a 12 and a half year prison sentence. In a defiant statement, he told Judge Paul Plunkett, if my name wasn't James Marcello, I wouldn't be standing in front of you. That's all I have to say. He was released from a federal prison camp in Milan, Michigan on April 6, 1995, and returned to his home in Lombard, Illinois. After his release, he worked for a nursing home operator in Oak Brook Terrace, Illinois, but soon found himself facing the family secrets trial. Biden administration has proposed new staffing standards to improve care for the 1.3 million Americans living in nursing homes. Marcello and his half-brother, Michael Mickey Marcello, faced murder and racketeering charges. He was accused of several murders, including that of Nicholas D'Andrea in 1981, Nicholas Cerillo Sr. in 1982, and the notorious Spilotro brothers in 1986. The indictment also alleged that the Marcello brothers ran a profitable video gambling business from 1996 to 2004. Shortly after his indictment, Marcello attempted to secure his release on bond by offering properties worth $12.5 million including several high-value homes. However, on April 29, 2005, U.S. District Judge James Zagel denied his request. In September 2007, Marcello was convicted of racketeering conspiracy involving years of extortion, loan sharking, and murder. On February 5, 2009, he received a life sentence for the Spilotro murders. Judge Zagel expressed regret that Marcello had not led a better life while sentencing him to life behind bars. Following his sentencing, Marcello was sent to the high-security United States Penitentiary in Atwater, California. However, due to ongoing appeals,
he was transferred back to the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Chicago. City is now at the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, a place that's been described as hell on earth. Fox News' Lisa Evers is at MDC right now on Diddy's Life Behind Bars. Even though his appeals were nearly exhausted, the federal government attempted to transfer him back to Atwater in February 2012. But Judge Zoggle insisted he remain in Chicago until the appeal was resolved. Marcello is now imprisoned at ADX Florence Super Prison in Colorado. Now, Let's talk about Ramzi Ahmed Youssef. On September 1, 1992, Youssef entered the United States with a questionable Iraqi passport. His companion, Ahmed Aj, had several fake documents, including a poorly forged Swedish passport, to distract officials and help Youssef pass through. Aj was immediately arrested when immigration officers found bomb-making manuals, extremist videos, and a cheat sheet in his luggage. Investigators linked their travel to a call from Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, a militant preacher from Egypt. Youssef was detained for 72 hours and questioned multiple times, but due to overcrowding, was given a hearing date of November 9, 1992, for his asylum request, claiming to be Abdul Basit Mahmoud Abdul Karim from Pakistan, stating he lost his passport. In December 1992, the Pakistani consulate in New York issued a temporary passport under this alias. While moving around New York and New Jersey, Youssef stayed in contact with Abdel Rahman using a cell phone. Between December 3rd and 27, 1992, he made conference calls to key numbers in Pakistan. Aj never reclaimed the bomb manuals and tapes, which remained at the FBI's New York office after being released by Judge Rina Raghi in December 1992. Youssef, along with Mohammed A. Salam and Mahmoud Abua, began assembling a massive one 500-pound bomb in his Jersey City home. He ordered chemicals while recovering from a car accident caused by Salam on December 29, 1992. Aj warned Youssef that retrieving the manuals could jeopardize his business. One book he carried was later identified by the FBI as containing the word Al-Qaeda, which means the base. In a 2002 interview, co-conspirator Abdul Rahman Yassin revealed that Youssef originally planned to attack Jewish neighborhoods in New York City, but changed his mind after visiting Crown Heights and Williamsburg. On February 26, 1993, Youssef rented a rider van and packed it with explosives. He loaded four cardboard boxes filled with paper bags, newspapers, urea, and nitric acid along with three red metal cylinders of compressed hydrogen. Then these couple other marks, this plus means that it can be overpressured a little bit. Um, and then the star means that it's good for 10 years. If you don't have a star, it's good. And four large containers of nitroglycerin and blasting caps. He drove the van into the garage of the World Trade Center, where it exploded. Youssef managed to escape the U.S. just hours later, reportedly fleeing to Iraq and then to Pakistan. The FBI added him to its 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list on April 21, 1993. Back in Pakistan, Youssef went into hiding. That summer, he allegedly tried to assassinate Pakistani Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, but the plot failed when police intervened. He fled, but the bomb he was handling exploded prematurely. On December 11, 1994, Youssef carried out a trial run by boarding Philippine Airlines Flight 434 from Manila to Tokyo with a stop in Cebu. Using a forged Italian passport, he assembled a bomb in the airplane's lavatory and set it to detonate in four hours. While the bomb exploded mid-flight over Japan, it only killed one passenger, Haruki Kagami, and injured ten others. The explosion caused damage but didn't destroy the aircraft, which made an emergency landing in Okinawa. After the incident, the plane became a crime scene, and investigators traced the clues back to Manila. Upon returning to Manila, Youssef prepared more bombs, but a fire in his apartment led to a police raid. They discovered plans for attacks, including a plot to crash planes into CIA headquarters. Authorities were on high alert, and the Federal Aviation Administration warned airlines after the Iranian shrine bombing. Youssef then began planning the Bojinka plot, 
which included attempts to assassinate Pope John Paul II and bomb several flights. Despite a global manhunt, Youssef escaped to Pakistan on January 31, 1995. He flew from Pakistan to Thailand, where he met with associate Isak Parker, instructing him to check bombs on Delta Airlines and United Airlines flights. However, Parker, frightened to follow through, returned to Youssef's hotel and falsely claimed it was too risky. Youssef wanted to get bombs onto a plane heading to the US, so he contacted a friend with diplomatic immunity in Qatar. This friend agreed to take the suitcase to London and check it onto a flight to the US, hoping that the friend's immunity would ensure the suitcases were loaded onto the plane. The plan was for the bombs to explode mid-flight and destroy the plane. However, the suitcases were never checked in. Youssef and Parker returned to Pakistan on February 2, 1995. Following a tip from Parker on February 7, 1995, Pakistani and U.S. agents raided Room 16 at the Sukasa Guest House in Islamabad and captured Youssef before he could move to Peshawar. Parker was later paid $2 million for providing the information that led to Youssef's capture. During the raid, agents found flight schedules for Delta and United Airlines, along with bomb parts hidden in children's toys. Youssef had chemical burns on his fingers and was sent to a federal prison in New York City until his trial. On September 5, 1996, Youssef and two accomplices were convicted for their roles in the Bojinka plot. Youssef received a life sentence without parole and is currently serving his sentence at ADX Florence, the most secure prison in the U.S. Stay tuned for more insightful videos and subscribe the channel.